Polly Bobo case has adjourned for the day, so we did hear from the judge that the defense may rest its case by tomorrow. The last witness on the stand was a private investigator who drove some of the roads in what she described as sort of an average speed, although apparently none of the roads have speed limit signs on them in this area. So uh, the prosecution tried to get into whether or not the, the times and the speeds she recorded were in some way accurate because Maybe anybody can drive any speed they want on some of these roads. I don't know. Um, you know, Julie Rendleman is here with me. And Julie, I'm running out of words for this case. I really am. I'm really not sure. I hope you don't ask me to speak right now. You know, I'm, I'm just... where else to go with this thing? So why don't we start dissecting the testimony from earlier today of Terry Dykus, the Tennessee Bureau of Investigation investigator who was called to the stand by the defense. Mm -hmm. Am I supposed to respond? I, yeah, okay. I'm, I'm just this throwing this on the table because I, I'd like to hear your analysis because I know that, that you um, have very little to say about this case that's good. I'll, I'll, say, I'll say this. You know, I was watching this um, back in my office and all I could think about was like my fantasy of being a prosecutor in Tennessee because honestly, if I got to be a, a prosecutor there, I could do whatever the hell I wanted whenever the hell I wanted. That's how I felt like watching this case. I don't know what's going on. I know that we always talk to jurors at trial before we start about um, don't watch Law and Order. This case is nothing like Law and Order. Don't watch those silly things you see on TV where they kind of make pretend that they're on trial. We are literally watching, to me, we are watching kind of everything you tell jurors never happen during a trial. I am dumbfounded. I am. I wrote to Kathy earlier that I'm disgusted. I don't know where the rule of law is in this case. I don't understand how testimony is coming in. Can, can I stop now? Do you want I, I mean, to keep I going? Even, actually, I, first I, I'm of all, just well, I'm going to start taking notes on Julie Rendleman's opinions. One is um, fantasy. Fantasy Tennessee prosecutor. Tennessee prosecutor. I think there's like a, a computer second, game we can develop. As a second life, I would like to come back as a Tennessee prosecutor and just get to do whatever the hell well, I Well, look, want. I mean, the, I, I, I was warned in law school, at least, that if you're a defense attorney, then you need to be wary for prosecutors to try to take every liberty possible. Sure. And it, that's why you've got to be on the ball with objections, which is why I've been sitting here throwing a fit about this defense attorney not doing jack squat to object. I... It, and I've said to you before, while I agree with everyone that she's weak, you know, she's not doing her job, one of the things that everyone must realize is that there come, once you object once, twice, three times, and the judge keeps shooting you down, you either object the whole time and the judge is going to get mad at you, and that may turn off the jury, or you... Oh, well, I, I mean, at this point, I would say, oh, well, it, because at this it, point, the jury's just going to hear everything getting thrown into the case at once, and, and there's a greater chance that they'll convict because they're hearing everybody from Uncle Freddie who lived a couple counties okay. over. Well, I heard on the radio that this guy <laughs> did it, so yeah, I think he did it. Well, okay, well, if way, that's just... all going to come into the case, you, you, it doesn't matter what gets presented in this case. It matters whether you object and it's on the record. I that's the I only just, thing that matters I just said at this you point. You don't even need to call witnesses to yeah. this case. You just need to call the detective, and he'll give you his opinion about anything, what the weather should or shouldn't be, the food he likes. I, there is no nothing that makes sense to me in this case in regards to what people are testifying. I don't understand how a detective can testify to not only statements people made that are not testifying in the case, co-defendants statements of which are not testifying in this case, testify about cell site information, phone records. I have, unless I'm wrong that all these records are coming in and the jury's going to have an opportunity to review them, how on earth is he giving his opinion about those things of which no one else can cross-examine? He's telling where he thinks people were at certain times based on his assumption as a detective. I, what, I don't understand what's going on. I, it's, it's a circus. It's a joke to me. Yeah, I agree. I don't look. Julie Rendleman and I are in complete agreement about this, folks. Please write it down. 4:31 p.m. Tuesday, September 19th. It will never happen this again. Is, it, it may. Well, it may. It may. It may. So, um, you know, we're going to listen to some of this testimony of Terry Dykus. I think we're up to clip 126. This is the guy we're talking about here. So um, let's listen to a little bit more of this fiasco from earlier, and we'll be back in a second. In your minds. 7.45, the time she was abducted. Yes, sir. To the time that you think the phone was discarded? The phone was disconnected. It wasn't discarded until um, later on that day. Okay, so until the time the phone 
stops. Correct. Until <laughs> the, the battery was taken out. The time she's taken that follows the cell phone pings. Correct. Until the time that's over. Yes, sir. And their whereabouts that day, they said they were with each other, except for Jason Autry, right? Yes, sir. So your three of your suspects, whose names kept on coming up, coming up, coming up, said they were all with each other. Yes, sir. Right? Correct. You opined about somebody else's alibi before. You said it was like garbage. Yes, sir. You have three suspects whose names keep on coming up and they're trying to alibi each other. Is that right? Yes, sir. Except Mr. Altry, right? Right. He got up with them later on that day, I believe. Mr. Altry tells you he gets with them later, correct? Yes. But at the critical time, he gives you another alibi, right? <laughs> Uh, yes, that's correct. About working on a farm? Correct. Correct? Yes, sir. With a co-worker there too, correct? Yes, I believe he said he was working with a Douglas guy. <coughs> and you should check that wait, out. Wait, wait. He was working with what? Somebody coughed. OJ or Mike Douglas, uh, one of those. Okay. Some, some Douglas man, I believe. <coughs> In fact, it was Mr. Douglas's farm and working with another man. Right. We're talking about the same people, right? Correct. And when you checked that the first time, did that check out? Yes. But it didn't stop there, did it? What do you mean? I mean, you got information after that, didn't you? Yes. And the information after that was that, no, I was wrong. He wasn't at my farm this morning. You need to look at it, <clears throat> correct? Yes. So you have three people, Shane, Dylan, and Zach, alibying each other. <clears throat> yes, sir. That day. And then you have Jason Autry, alibi not checking out at all, correct? I wouldn't say that. Jason Autry, at one point, he's north of the interstate calling Lisa Autry or um, Angela Scott, one of his ex-girlfriends. So his phone record showed that he was a different part other than where Holly was. And on top of that, well, Jason Autry is huge. Do you remember, remember what you're about to say? Okay, okay. all right. Let's see, because I want to help you. Can we just finish his answer first? I mean, I want him to come back to it. But okay. If I could take it in pieces, I think it would be easier. Even though these farmers had told you no, he wasn't with us. You said that you have his cell phone north of the interstate that morning, correct? Yes, sir. Talking to, as you remember it, either his wife or his girlfriend, Angela Scott. Right, correct? yes, sir. That's right. And you're right about that. At 6.50 in the morning, okay? He is up in Camden, north of the interstate, okay. leaving his girlfriend's house, okay? Okay. So think about this. Okay. I'm think with you. This. All right. Are crimes always committed by one person? Sexual crimes are invariably committed by one person. Sexual predators work alone. So that was an assumption that you were making back then, correct? Uh, yes. That this was a sexual <clears throat> production, whatever you want to call it. Right. Well, when you rule out all the other motives for a kidnapping, you're left with sexual, uh, an abduction for sexual purposes. Mm -hmm. Sexual predators invariably work alone. Yes, I, th I think I understand what you said. Okay. I think the answer to that is yes. It was an assumption that you were making. It was an assumption that the behavior analysis unit based told on, us to make. Based assumption. on research of all the crimes that they've looked at over and over again, of these sexual crimes, they tell us, rule out, don't even consider looking at two people. Don't even look at it. Look at one person. It happened for one person. And is that assumption? Welcome back to Law News, everybody. We are listening to some of the testimony from earlier today in the Holly Bobo case. That was one of the investigators on the stand. 
Julie, some of your analysis of that. <laughs> You're running out of things to say, it seems. Look, we were complaining about the hearsay. Well, that that every time they just say, oh, it's not for the truth of the matter, it just gets in. By the way, on top of everything, this investigator, is he a detective? I don't know, whatever you call him, is, is am I allowed to say idiot? So I, on top of everything, you have a witness that's an absolute fool. So I can't even... I can't, comp I, I can't comprehend what's going on. I'm actually, I think I'm starting to speak in an accent uh, only because I'm <laughs> listening to well, it. Well, that, so that aside, I mean, you know, look, yeah, it, it seems that this person is just testifying to just about anything under the sun that he heard from anybody, Eddie, Freddie, <laughs> this, that, and the other thing. Who said it? Why is he it relevant? Just, he just said that um, sexual predators only work by themselves. What, what, what analysis theory expert, like, who the heck is he yeah, to be able to, you know, give an opinion in regards to who commits sexual acts or s criminal acts? I don't even understand where it comes from. You know, and he, he was trying to get into some of these other theories. He's like, well, you know, if I had one piece that doesn't fit, I moved on to the next suspect. Well, that doesn't make any sense either because there are pieces that don't fit against this defendant. Correct. Okay, and it, you know just as well as I knew, okay, well, you know, there might be one or two pieces that don't fit against any defendant, but it could still result in a conviction depending on everything else. It's, it can, I, I just, can I, I can only imagine what the jury looks like. Like, does the jury look like I do where they're just like, their, their mouth is open at all times just in awe because they don't know what the heck's going on? Or are they actually thinking this is the way it's supposed to happen? I don't know because I'm not sitting in the courtroom and it's the one piece of information that I lose from sitting in here, you know, but let's talk about some of this other stuff. The, the statements of the co-defendants. In a real trial, Julie, how does Julie Rendleman defend a client if there are co-defendants who are not in the instant proceeding? Well, the Usually, and somebody tries to bring their statements Usually, in. I mean, under Crawford, they're not allowed in. So the testimony, the statements, I'm sorry, not testimony, the statements of co-defendants um, in a case are not allowed in with very few exceptions. I mean, one of the exceptions is arguably if it's a statement against their penal interest. For example, if they're saying something that you wouldn't expect to support them, you know, and therefore it gives it a reliability of truth. But I haven't seen any exceptions for anything that has come in with regards to what any of the co-defendants said in this case. Um, it just seems that they're allowed in because because the prosecutor wants it in, and so therefore it comes in. Well, and, and you know, this witness has been on the stand today was a defense witness. I was just going to say I'm it's guessing, actually the defense as well I'm that's getting in. guessing that the defense is going to just turn around and say, well, you know, it was mostly all these other people and not him, and the investigators are j just a mess because they looked at the wrong people, and you can't trust the investigation. I don't, I, I don't you know, know how it's necessarily. I don't think it's a help. winning theory. Yeah, I don't know why. Why is she pursuing that though? That's the part I don't understand. Her best focus is on the possible other suspects. It sounds to me like there's several, at least one other suspect that. Um, doesn't have an absolute tight alibi. And so all you need to do for the jury is leave them with reasonable doubt, and that's enough for them to acquit somebody. So I'm not sure why pursuing the whole matter with regards to these specific, d this defendant and his co-defendants is helping. I think it's actually confusing the issue. Well, you know, look, it, it seems to me that this defense attorney isn't so much worried about raising reasonable doubt as she's worried about trying to relitigate the case and prove somebody else did it. That seems to be the way the questioning is going, which is, doesn't make any sense, but that just seems but the, Again, but the minute, the way but the minute you start to have the jury believe that that Shane is buddies with the defendant, who's buddies with um, the brother, the minute you start to get that in the jury's head, they start to believe, well, if they're all buddies and they all hang out together, then they're more likely to have committed the crimes of which they're accused of. So I don't know how it helps. I, if, if I'm the defense attorney, I'm going to try to steer away from that and focus more on the potential other people. Okay, uh, I didn't catch this earlier, but Kathy Russin just pointed it out to me. Terry Dykus, the investigator, he's now an attorney. Oh, well, well, Kathy, thank God we have, you know, an, a, a great man amongst our midst. So good for us. Uh, and not amongst my midst. I'm not a member of the Tennessee Good for the bar. bar. Good for the bar. Look, we're going to go to the Morris Brothers trial now in Phoenix because this is a trial of two NBA players and one other defendant who are accused of aggravated assault there. The victim was on the stand last night. The defense is trying to say that there's no clear evidence that the NBA players or this other person were involved in the attack. Uh, we're going to be covering this case uh, as long as it runs here on Law News and the testimony is going to run relatively late, so we'll be here for the duration.